I'm going to invite our speaker for today, and our speaker is not a stranger to us. He's, he's one of us. Um, he's been ministering to us quite a number of times. He's been a member of this church for many years. In fact, uh, you know, you've had, we've had a whole journey. We had the small tent where we used to meet. Then we had the upstairs when we used to meet. Then we're in the big tent. So he's been through the whole, <laughs> he's been through the whole journey. And uh, he's, he's ministers to high schools. He ministers to university students. Uh, his heart is right there. And we are really glad that he's here with us today. And uh, so, John, you may just come forward. Great. And uh, so we're going to hear him speak to us today. And it's a joy to always have him come and minister to us. Um, let's raise our hands towards him as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servant, Johnny Gathuku. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his family. We thank you because you have given him the word of life and is going to break this bread for us today. As he ministers to us, minister to him. As he equips us, equip him. Now, Lord, one thing we know, you give us all good things. And one of the things you give us is finances. And Lord, sometimes we can be slaves to the gifts you've given us. But you desire that we do not become slaves. That what you give us becomes a blessing to us and we become a blessing to others. For the blessings of the Lord are to be made blessings to other people too. So Lord, speak to us on stewardship of finances in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's put our hands together for Johnny. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Ben. It's always a great privilege to come and uh, share the word of life um, in this congregation. And I am so thankful to the blessing that we have to have a platform where we can talk about God's word freely. Um, and um, we are continuing on with a series on Your Money Matters, Financial Wisdom from the parables of Jesus. I want to believe that every uh, cell group has opportunity to look at this text and this study. It's been quite, um, it's quite an experience for me. Oh, thank you. It's been quite an experience for me um, and my family as we have lately been just asking ourselves and reflecting on what Christ has to say. And primarily is because there are those things that Paul taught or what Paul reminded the church, but the things that Jesus himself expressly said, the things that he redefined, um, the things that he himself spoke much more clearly, carry a lot of weight. There are things we argue about what he meant and what, uh, what we later on interpreted it, but there are things that were clear cut what he was talking about. And um, so, and, and therefore we, we carry on uh, to talk about uh, this parable in Luke chapter 12. Um, Mwangi Therud started us off and I will carry on there. So I'll be making reference a lot from uh, the part two of the parable of the rich fool. If you can remember from your cell group. Let me read. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat and about or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. Jesus in uh, from here verse 22 he is now making the address to the disciples he first responded to the man who asked a question if you remember that that he was speaking and he was surrounded with, uh, by a number of people uh, together with these disciples so he first responded to the man and he responded to the man with a question the man said you know master would you tell my brother to share his inheritance with me? And Jesus asked him, who made me your judge or arbiter? You know, there's a joke that goes about Jews, that Jews um, 
answer questions with questions. Um, so there's this, and there's one student who asked, why do Jews answer questions with questions? And then the professor in the seminary is telling him, why not? <laughs> <laughs> he's a Jew and Jews used to answer questions with questions and Jesus would hardly give you a straightforward answer every time you ask Jesus a question he would give you a more complex response for you to chew on so Jesus responds makes a statement to that gentleman then he gives a parable to the other listeners and Jesus used to speak to, in parables to those who are not his followers so later on now, he then privately meets with the disciples and now he is unpackaging the parable. So this is the sweet part about the parable we learned um, in the previous Sundays. So he said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And he takes it to the lowest form. Do not worry about what to eat or your body what it you will wear. Now, Jesus goes back to the very bottom of the bottom. And this is now the new definition of your basic need. Because it is upon, the, when you understand what is a basic need, then we are able now to define who is a rich man and who, who is poor. Now, according to Jesus, he missed out on a number of components from the U UN human rights definition of basic needs. When I was in primary school, we were taught there are three basic needs in life. Food, clothes, shelter, and clothing. So Jesus missed one. According to Jesus, shelter is not a basic need. You need to revise uh, the wrong education you received. According to Jesus, you have two basic needs in life. Food and clothing. Period. Anything beyond that, <laughs> he doesn't consider it basic. And even then, he is saying, do not worry even about your basic need. In that reference, therefore, I would like also to define who is a rich person uh, so that we are, we are on the same plane. Because sometimes... Being rich is a very relative term. If the basic need, therefore, is food and clothing, we would say that a poor person is someone who cannot afford food and clothing. They are living below their basic needs. And then someone who is rich is whoever is able to have food and clothing and be able to purchase many other things, like smartphones, like specs, like uh, <laughs> I was giving a joke in the morning that I visited uh, an elderly man in Mudaiga, and uh, I remember I I alighted. You know, Mudaiga there are no matatus, so you either alight on this other side or the other side. So I alighted on one side of oil Libya, and I footed about a kilometer inside. Um, so we went, he hosted me at his lawn garden, his beautiful mansion sitting on five acres. Uh, then we had chai. Then he asked me, can I escort you? So he, he got me out because I think he had mercy on me. I had walked in uh, for long. So he took me in his car. Then once we got to another home, he told me, ah, look at that house. It's so big. Where do people get such money? <laughs> And then I'm seated with him and I'm wondering, <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> I don't even own a quarter. And I was shocked that people in Mudaiga think other people are rich. I mean, it was, was fascinated. They even also think other people are rich and they don't understand where people get such kind of money. And, and so, friends, sometimes when, we, when the pastor is talking about rich people, you immediately disqualify yourself. Because maybe you use the yardstick of uh, William Samoy Ruto, or maybe you use the yardstick of Trump, or use the yardstick of your boss, because you manage the accounts, so you see 
the kind of flow of money. But Jesus considers you rich as long as you're able to have food and clothing. And we all have different uh, levels and degrees of our wealth. So it is a Guinness start that this conversation now carries on. And Jesus says this and explains to his disciples. Consider the ravens. He uses one, uh, the bird ravens, and then he also uses the lilies. He says, consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap like human beings do. And they have no storerooms or barn to keep what they have collected for that day. Yet God feeds them. Now, the raven, if you look at the Old Testament, uh, it doesn't have a very good uh, PR. The raven is among the two birds that were released to go and check out whether the flood after Noah, uh, after the flood during Noah's time, uh, Noah let out a raven and a, and a dove. Did the raven come back? It's not given in very good light. When God wanted to show how powerful he is, he used a raven to supply to prophet Elijah. I mean, that was the most unlikely of birds to be generous, isn't it? Um, and it's one of the birds that actually eats meat closer to the vultures. Then I think Jesus is telling them, listen, you see that bird? That bird that we do not think of it very highly. I feed that bird. And it doesn't even need to keep uh, what it has collected. I supply for it every day. Then he says, how much more are you than birds? If I supply for the ravens, how much more precious are you? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Now, since you cannot do this very little thing of just adding one hour to your life, why do you worry about the rest? Jesus is saying, adding an extra hour to your life is such a little thing <laughs> that to him, one hour of a human being is such a little, it's a little thing in his eyes. Then he is saying, you need first to have life so that you can get worried about life. Because without life, you can't worry about life. Isn't it? So you first need life. So life is first basic. Then now you can worry about, you can worry about life. Now you, you are worrying about life and you can't even provide life to worry about. Are you getting the joke with Jesus? You, you can't provide the basic that is necessary to create the worry. To give room for the worry. He is saying even one single hour you can't provide for it. Why are you worrying about the rest? what you're going to eat or drink. Then he goes and says this, consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin like human beings do to provide for their clothing. In fact, the other thing is that Jesus is making a statement concerning how he provides for humans. Okay? When he is telling the human being, do not worry about your future, what you're going to eat or drink, he is not asking the human being to stay at home and veg on the couch. And then go to Cataloni and pray for another one week. You're going to go hungry, my brother. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, human beings sow and reap. By the fact of working hard, it is your expression of showing faith in the God that provides, because according to creation, humans work for their food. Now that working is not providing for yourself, it is, your, it is how you receive from the creator. It is not your smartness. Working and, and working, sowing and reaping, because here he gives the analogy of agriculture, sowing and reaping. That whole process is ordained by God, and that's how he desires to provide for us. Now we need to understand that that's actually a provision of God. The fact that we can work, that in itself is an act of faith. 
And I have one of my friends who is a farmer who, who told me, you know, farmers are closer to God than all other professions. <laughs> because <laughs> farmers have to relate with God so well so that it rains. <laughs> and so that it doesn't flood and, they are, and their crops are not damaged by locusts. They need really to work with God very well. It is, a, it is one of the first professions where you have to have a very good relationship with the Lord. Otherwise, you can miss the planting seasons. You can, you, you can actually make serious losses when you're not understanding and being able to understand what to do. And God says, I am the one who teaches the farmer what to do. Including all the ways and the different ways that we harvest. Now, when it comes to how we dress, the clothes that we wear, we labor for them. We labor, we, we grow the cotton and we spin it. And out of that spinning, that's how we get our clothes. Then God is saying, even then, I'm the one who provides through that means. That means of laboring and spinning, it is my provision for the human. Yet I tell you, for the lilies that do not do what humans do, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like any one of them. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. How much more will he clothe you who bears his own image? O ye of little faith, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Now, Jesus makes a very strong statement there. He says this, the pagan world that does not know me, the pagan world that doesn't relate with me, their system of operation is undergirded by this worry. This worry is what drives the economy. This worry is what actually, um, is what is entrenched in most of their everyday operations. Now, this saying is so difficult because you almost feel you need to get out of the current system of economics for, for, for this saying to make sense. Otherwise, we would get all insurance people out of work. Because insurance industry operates on your worry. As long as you're worried, insurance thrives. As long as you're careless, insurance industry can, can die in a single day. Isn't it? Including all the investment and financial analysts. They need to show you how risky life ahead is. And the more riskier <laughs> your future looks, the more you engage their services and consult them. Isn't it? Our whole banking industry thrives on the fact that you're thinking about the future. Isn't it? And you're thinking about what you're going to eat next year and the year coming forth. So the way our system is at the moment, this is not the kind of thing you want to hear from Jesus. You'll tell Jesus, well, where we are at right now, Loans is how we operate and live by. So if you tell me not to think, you're not being practical. I mean, to be honest. So when you're reading this chapter, you have two temptations. One is to ignore it and say, well, Jesus meant something else. <laughs> it's only that I'm not understanding what he really, really, really meant. I'll ask pastor when we, when we meet again. Oh, he was using it figuratively for this gentleman who was greedy in, in his heart, and that's not in my condition, okay? Me, I am an okay believer. <laughs> and even Pastor Ben knows I am okay. I didn't have a problem like that man who is greedy. But brothers and sisters, this scripture was not just hyperbolical. It is not even figurative, and we are going to look at it. It's one of the hard sayings of Jesus that was actually implemented thereafter. And people believed him, literally, to what he was saying. But before we get there, can we get back to the slides? 
Um, next slide. Again, I think we have um, Paul reiterating what Jesus was saying. So we also find that the thing that Jesus said not to worry about what you're going to eat and drink is a theme carried out at the rest of the New Testament. And we find that thinking to be with the apostles and the disciples that later on followed Jesus. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. I remember when I was younger, my elder sister was telling me, if I was a wealthy person, I would refuse to die. I mean, I would refuse. How can I live with so much wealth? <laughs> After I've labored, that I would refuse to die. It was very funny when it is said in Kikuyu. Um, <laughs> but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. What Paul is also saying, we need to be content. As long as you have food and clothing, we need to be content with that. But let me also give you a few um, things that therefore Jesus says, if the pagans run after these things, therefore those who follow me, I have given them something different and they do not run after such things. Basically that's how I can only interpret it. You now who are my believers, that those who, those who know me, don't worry about these things. They don't worry about what to eat and drink. Those who don't know me, the pagans who don't believe in God, their world, their systems, their thinking, their, their whole being and operations runs on this. They are constantly, constantly worried and thinking and stressed about what to eat and drink. Exactly that's what Jesus is saying. So he is saying that once you encounter me, one of the things that you will experience is that I will give you peace and rest. And you will no longer be bothered and overconsumed in your mind over the things that those who do not know me are preoccupied with. Until you will look abnormal in their midst. Because you seem to have a peace they cannot understand. Let me give you a few things that probably would indicate um, that you need to have that encounter with Christ. An encounter from being worried to having peace and rest in him. And you know, when I think about this, I think about uh, what Jesus says, come unto me, all ye who are, and I'll give you rest for your, for your soul. You know, bear my yoke. Come. You know, carry my yoke. My yoke is light. Now, I have a few tests for you. Okay, so check on the wall and start ticking. Sawa, sawa. Take a, take a pen. Take a pen and a paper where you are. We start ticking. Have you ever lost a relationship over money and possessions? In other words, you are friends with someone. <laughs> but the reason actually why your friendship was lost. Money was involved. Okay? Money was involved. Number two. You secretly desire to be rich even though you don't tell us. <laughs> when you're walking around the city, your heart is constantly coveting. And you know, I remember we were, we were given um, the scripture that those who desire to be rich need to memorize. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. Um, it's, a, it's, it's one they can claim and, and, and pray through every day. It's a very powerful one. Those who desire to be rich. Uh, media, are you able to flip? And we just jump there. But those who desire to be rich, First Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. 1 Timothy 6, 9. But those who desire to be rich, now all of you who desire to be rich secretly, this is your promise. Those who want to get rich, not those who are rich. Look at the scripture. It's not talking about the ones who are rich. Those who? <laughs> those who? 
Those, the other version says, those who desire, those who want, those who long and hope to be rich. This is your promise you get from scriptures. You will all fall into a temptation and a trap. Not may, it is guaranteed. You will fall into a temptation and a trap. Thereafter, you will also fall into many, not two, many foolish and harmful desires that are born of the desire, out of the desire to be rich. You know, the desire to be rich comes in double-double. Okay? So you first fall into a temptation, a temptation is not enough, you also fall into a trap. Because you are the ones who contributed to the desi, you are in sports betting. So you fall into temptations and a trap. And into many foolish and harmful desires that also plunge people into ruin and I don't even know what's the difference between ruin and destruction. Which one is worse? So that secret, that secret desire to be rich creates a worry in the heart on how to get there. Because it is a desire. And it doesn't mean the desire is not a function of your wallet. The desire is a function of your heart. So you can be very broke, but you have a desire to be rich. So don't say that I don't desire to be, even, even the, actually the, the, the poorer you are, the higher the propensity to the desire. It is very dangerous. And even also when you have rich friends, rich friends also make you, they stir up that desire even the more. Isn't it? it? Number three, over 80% of your prayers are about money. Okay? Those are, now I'm talking about the people with signs who need an encounter with Christ. Hallelujah. To be given rest for their, for their souls. If you examine the prayers of Paul, and I hope we can actually go through the prayers of Paul, you will find that hardly did Paul pray about money. The prayers of Paul all through scriptures and in almost every letter to the churches that he wrote, he used to have, he used to dedicate almost a whole chapter to prayer because the opening address would be, and I pray for you. And what are the things that Paul used to pray for you, for them? I pray for you that you increase in and that love will abound. He hardly prayed about money. So, but if your prayers are about 80%, it is actually the expression of your worry to the Lord. It is not so much prayer. <laughs> it is just your expression of the worry. You've told it to your wife, you've told it to your children, you've told it to your friends. Now you're also telling it to, to God, the expression of your worry. We do still pray. Number four is that your giving is below the minimum. You have not even gotten to the threshold of giving because it is 10%. Number five, you work overtime at the expense of relationships and family. Hello? Are we still ticking? You stay late, you pick up extra jobs, and you're doing those things at the expense of relationships. You're, you're sacrificing important relationships to gain an extra income. That's part of your worry. Because you're worried it won't be enough. So you need to continue picking up and heaping up the different uh, sources of income that are compromising important relationships already existing in your life. Number six is that you've, you realize you have made unnecessary purchases. You bought something so big then later on you realize, mm, I actually didn't need it. And that has happened over a few, a few times. Uh, number seven sounds familiar. You've lost so much money in investments that don't succeed. I have a friend that I think we have had to have very difficult coffee conversations because he had invested in so many areas, most of them which he is not even an expert. But as long as he has a conversation with this gentleman, then he hears, this is what is making money right now. He puts money there. Then he has a conversation the other month with another person. He puts the money there. It's not so much that you're a businessman. It's actually greed. You're not divesting. You know that we talk about divesting. It's an expression of your worry about the future and the things you want to accumulate um, in the years to come. Number eight is that you're perpetually overburdened with loans. 
One of the greatest prisons that believers are not able to serve God effectively is loans. I mean, I wish we can have a whole day just to discuss about this. The point in which our hearts are worried about the future. The extent in which we struggle and the stress we carry with the amount of also the multiple loans that we have. It's not just a single loan that you took when you had an emergency. Your life looks like it is always a... It is always an emergency. You know loans are meant for emergency, but your life is constantly a, an emergency. It's as if your life is constantly on crisis. That you are constantly being bailed out, including a loan that bails out this other loan, that bails out the smaller one, that negotiates with the bigger one. I mean, you, you know that kind of life. It's not even the conversation we can have that, you know, I had planned this, but something happened, I needed a, short, I, I needed a loan to get it out. Once it was out, I was back to normal. No, for you, it's a perpetual, it's a perpetual life. It is actually the expression of the fact that you, you want everything because the loan, the credit facilities give you an uncontrolled passions of whatever you want. Because it means I can access whatever I want immediately. It doesn't allow me to think about it. It doesn't allow me to pray about it. It doesn't allow me to consult anyone. Because I have access to credit, my heart is on a free range. That's what it means. And it is dangerous to be in such a position where you can access as much credit as you would love to. Today we are not talking about loans and there are bankers in the house who let me keep their jobs. But, dear friends, when you look at how Jesus spoke this, and Jesus knew, essentially, that the worry over our future, and that was also expressed by our love for money, flows out and chokes his worship from our hearts. And therefore, it, it was key and fundamental that you encounter Jesus there, and once you encounter Jesus there, where your heart finds rest and peace in him, where you find the freedom that the pagans do not know concerning finances, when you find a place whereby you are able to sit at home and enjoy fellowship and communion and relationship with your family, and at that point your mind is there with them, it is not thinking Constantly concerning business deals and you know the way we are preoccupied with it. Part of that is when our hearts have been captured by the things that make the pagan world spin over and over. Then Jesus says this. If you do not worry, then what should you worry about? He is saying, worry about my kingdom. Why? Because you will definitely worry. Let your worry be about my kingdom. And how do you worry about my kingdom? Because I know that you have needs. And as you labor and spin, and as you sow and reap, not when you're seated, as you work hard, I will bless you. And you will have enough. Therefore, as I satisfy you with what you need, then you can worry about my kingdom because you are not worrying about yourself. Because a man who is worrying about himself cannot serve God. A man who is worried about his future cannot give himself to the kingdom of God. You need to be freed in order to serve him with Abaddon. That's why you're not available for Bible study. <laughs> That's why you don't show up for cell groups. That's why maybe you're not available for many other engagements that give you an opportunity to invest in the heavenly kingdom. And yesterday when we were reviewing what I need to speak about with my wife and children, we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And one of the things that we noted was, Abraham told the rich man, you while you are on earth, <laughs> you had a good life. You ate well, 
In fact, the Bible says he dressed in purple. Until I thought I don't need to dress in purple anymore. <laughs> lest I go to hell. Anyway, but he said, you dressed well. Purple was the color of wealth and royalty. It was the color that showed power and influence. He said, you lived well. You were well fed and you lived well. So you lived well on earth. That was your portion. Now it is Lazarus' portion to live well. Then I thought, oh, that's what it means. Then I don't want to live very well here. I want to actually spend my money to allow others to live well. What he was saying is this. You chose to invest on earth. You didn't invest here. You chose to invest on earth. And now behold, you have nothing to recall to. Now that parable is a very, uh, it's not a parable because it actually mentions names and Abraham and really people. But it's a very complicated text. Because it doesn't talk about anything else about the, the rich man. It doesn't talk about anything else about Lazarus. We are not told about whether Lazarus was a righteous man. The only, we are only given about the economic state. But that text seems to imply that the rich man ignored Lazarus. When I was growing up in Sunday school, I thought Lazarus used to eat the crabs of the rich man. But when we read the text yesterday, it said he desired to eat the crabs. So he didn't eat them. So the rich man gave him nothing. Can you imagine? So they lived together, but the sin of the rich man was living in oblivion. It was the fact that he was insensitive to the needs of those people around him. Can you imagine you can go to hell by the simple fact that you live insensitive to the needs around you? God called that wickedness. The fact that you live well, you live in a well-stoned house, there are people you pass every day, there are people God has placed around you with great needs, who are poor, who are needy, but you do nothing about it, you ignore it. And one of the dangerous things about uh, just having a good life is this. When you have a good life, you stay in a house that is well-fenced. So nobody gets in. Okay? Then you get into a gadget that puts you in a capsule, which is called a car. And you lock up your windows. It, it prevents you from interacting with the world all the way to your next destination. So you can actually live in your own world. You're passing through people, but you're protected <laughs> inside the capsule. Isn't it? And remember where you came from. Also, people are not interacting with you because you also have a round fence that has barbed wire on top. So nobody gets in. So it gets you into the capsule and then delivers you to your office. And you can do that routinely for a whole year. Oblivious of what needs are around you, where you stay and the people you interact with. And the rich man was called wicked by the fact that he lived insensitively to the needs around him. But not only that, friends, when I look at the conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples, he tells them, sell your possessions and give to the poor. And I remember listening to this a while back. Uh, Pastor David Platt, uh, maybe that's one of, the, one of the books you should read. He has written a book called Radical. Um, and he's one of those pastors, I think, who left a church to, I think, go to, I think he had gone to Nepal for some time. And when he was preaching about um, when he was preaching about this text, did Jesus really mean it? Sell your possessions and give to the poor. He said, well, I don't think Jesus required this of everyone. Then he said, ah, then some people in the congregation felt, oh. <laughs> then he says, no, 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 no. Jesus meant it for anybody who has felt a relief from the fact that Jesus does not require it from everyone. If you have felt a relief that Jesus does not require <laughs> that you sell your possessions and give them to the poor, you are most likely the one he was speaking to. <laughs> if you have felt a relief in your heart, say, oh, he didn't require it from everybody, <laughs> then I'm okay. You are the one Jesus was speaking to as long as you have felt a little bit better. <laughs> the rich young ruler, when he comes and tells him, what can I do to, to get eternal life? He says, 
obey the commandments. This is I have. And he recounts for him all the Ten Commandments. And he gets to some place and says, even those ones I have done. I mean, this was extremely impressive because you're speaking to Jesus who knows everything. So he knows this young man is actually a righteous man by the standards of the law. And Jesus loved him. Then he told him, okay, one more thing you have. One more thing you have left. Now, once you do this, you become a saint. You don't even need to go to the Pope. Direct, you become a saint. Sell everything you have. After then, come and follow me. Ah, Jesus, umekuja sana. And he stopped and thought, hey, no, 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 now you have come too much. Jesus doesn't continue with that conversation. It is left hanging. We do not know what happened to that young, rich guy. But now when you get into, into the, when you get now into the other text, you can get back to the, to the next slide, you realize that everyone who interacted with Jesus seemed to have, once you encounter with him, Jesus seemed to have a redeeming effect on your wallet. Immediately. Like when you encounter with him, one of the signs we will know that you have encountered with him is how your wallet becomes liberated. I'm waiting for you to say amen. <laughs> As in, <laughs> you know the things that shows you the sign this person has gotten? Saved. It is what happens to the wallet. Now, look at the people who interact with Jesus. Jesus stands in the temple and stands next to the tithe box or the ones where people are giving offering. And a widow comes and places her offering. Mark chapter 12. What percentage did the widow give? A hundred percent. Everything she owned. What about Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus meets with Jesus. He was a tax collector. He used to work for KRA. Okay? But even him, you didn't even get the joke. He would negotiate with the business people on you give me a kadil so that you don't have to pay I mean to, he used to ex, extort on behalf of the Roman government to get taxes from the Jewish, Jewish people so the Jewish people hated the tax collectors because they were agents of the Roman government and they used to enrich themselves by putting a cap on top of the tax required by the emperor so this this short gentleman um, I'm, I'm remembering Governor Longanyangapu. This short man, and I was imagining if he was a tax collector, he was also very well <laughs> endowed. He climbs on a tree and invites Jesus into his house. He does a feast. A bash happens. After the bash happens, when he encounters with Jesus, immediately he gives 50% of his net worth to the poor. Now, do you know how much commissioners of KRA are worth? Do you know what it means to give 50% of that at a go, after, after they have encountered with Jesus? Then he says, anybody I took their bribe from, okay? Anybody I took a bribe from, anybody I extorted money for their papers to go through, I will return to them four times. The restitution was not just one to one. It was one to four. And I think that applies to everybody here who got born again when you used to be corrupt. So you know some of the property you own that you corrupted before you met the Lord? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and some of the cash you got in corrupt deals, you know very well that it did not come to you righteously. Once you encounter Jesus, the scripture seems to, make, to say you do restitution. You return that which did not belong to you. There's no way of cleansing it. Now I know I got this money through, <laughs> through corruption. Now let's cleanse it. And now it has become holy because I am holy. No, you take it back. <laughs> because by your corruption, someone is suffering. And they are crying out to God every day. Remember that. Every time you get tempted to pick corruption money, Remember this, when the poor cry out to God because they can't access certain services, that cry hits your house directly. 
because they are suffering on your account. Directly or indirectly. You don't even know them by name. You have never seen them. But your corruption has made them suffer. And God listens to the cry of the weak. The disciples after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit has come, it hits their wallet. They start selling their possessions because it is recorded like there were about 3,000 people gathered when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church in Jerusalem. So there was a crisis of how do we manage all these 3,000 visitors who have now also come to faith in Christ and they are new believers. So they sold their property and their possessions so that nobody could be in need and they would take care of them for as long as it was necessary for discipleship to happen. That was amazing. When you think about Joseph, in Acts chapter 4, the scripture says he sold his plot. You know, in the morning service, we asked all the kikuyus to repeat, he sold his plot. <laughs> we are not saying it. Kikuyus, let's say it together. He sold his plot. <laughs> he sold his plot and brought it and brought the income at the apostles' feet. Now that would be Pastor Ben. And Pastor Ben says, hallelujah. <laughs> then, he was not the only one who was selling a plot. Even Ananias was also decided to sell his plot. But Ananias in the evening got a conversation with his wife. He was like, I'm to pay 12 million for Kanisa. Mita kumi na bi? Pastor Ben atatosheka na milioni sita. Sindio? After all, we all know that not everybody gives more than even half a million. Sisi tumejaribu, ya tumejaribu. It is not the amount you give to us that we see. It is a percentage. And every giving you find in the New Testament, you look for any giving that shows up in the New Testament. When they talk about the Macedonian church, they were not giving 10%. They were giving 100 and I think 110. They were giving 110. Because the scripture says they gave beyond their means. There is no single reference, reference in the scripture, in the New Testament. There seems to be something happening with an encounter with Christ that frees a human being from the worry that comes around with money. And their hearts are freed and the expression, the expression, expression is generosity. <laughs> Let me try to take care of that. <laughs> the expression of the encounter with Christ is generosity. Because once we are freed by Jesus, and once we now have freedom in him, our wallets also become free. Praise the Lord. Now, allow me to give you two examples. Um, media team, you can prepare the, the testimony by Rick as I read this one. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist uh, Church, born in 1703, in 1731 he began to limit his expenses so that he would have more money to give to the poor. What I'm saying is this, is that this command about selling your possessions has been taken literally in the history of the church. It is not figurative. Oh, no, get, let's go back, let's go back. Still back to there. So, in the first year of his income, this is John Wesley, and he was Reverend John Wesley, so he was a pastor. His first income was 30 pounds, and he found that he could live on 28 pounds, so he gave away 2 pounds. In the second year, his income doubled, but he held his expenses even. So he had 32 pounds to give away, which was a comfortable year's income. In the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds, and he gave away 62 pounds. In his long life, Wesley's income advanced to as high as 1,400 pounds in a year, but he rarely let his expenses rise above 30 pounds. Brothers and sisters, one of the great lessons I learned from this practical application is you need to determine as a believer 
what is your living standard? And all of us don't have a, a common living standard, but you need to at least agree. You need to decide. What is your living standard? And it doesn't rise with increasing income. As your income increases, it is a greater opportunity for you to be generous. Not for you to buy more toys. And not for you to spoil yourself more. The more the income, the more opportunity for, general, for generosity. And many of us have not lived a life that inspires the rest of the body of Christ towards generosity. Our lives are causing other believers to be envious of our good life. In other words, we are living so luxuriously, we are living so selfishly, that we are inspiring other Christians to be more selfish. Your story of selflessness needs to inspire more selflessness to those who interact with you. Your generosity needs to inspire other people when they think about how generous you are and when they think about how much you have already said, this is my living standard. And since I'm going to live, and, and we are all different. You could be a living standard of 50,000. You could be a living standard of 100,000. You will be a living standard of 200,000. The Lord bless you. But if you can commit that and say, even 20 years to come, since I will not have changed, I will remain me, I know I can live on this money. I'm waiting for you to say amen. So I'm getting worried. So we keep talking, okay? It is a hard sermon, so let's keep talking. Let's keep talking to each other. Listen to this testimony from uh, Pastor Rick Warren. Media team. Influence comes not from what you get in life. Influence comes from what you give away in life. And the more you give away, the more influential you'll be. Now there's a difference between being famous and being influential. There are a lot of people who are famous who have no influence. There are a lot of selfish people who are famous but don't have real influence. When you want to help other people, influence comes from generosity. Here's what the Bible says, Proverbs 11, 24. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Psalm 112 says this, verse 9. Those who give generously to those in need, you're helping the poor, you're helping the unfortunate, will never be forgotten. You want a legacy? Help the poor. Will never be forgotten. They will have influence and honor. I have found this one to be true in my own personal life. The more generous I became, the more influential I became. You know my story. You know my story. 40 years ago when Kay and I got married, we started tithing our income, 10%. At the end of our first year of marriage, we raised our giving to, to the Lord and the charity to 11%. In the second year, we raised it to 12%. Third year, we raised it 3%. And, and, and fourth year, we keep adding. And even in tough times, we would always raise our giving a little bit. Why? Because I wanted my heart to grow bigger every year. I wanted to be more like Jesus. I wanted to be godly. I wanted to be like God. I wanted to be holy. Now, we weren't doing this to show off because as, as you know, I didn't tell anybody about this for over 25 years. We just quietly did it, raising our giving from 20% to 30 to 40% to 50% to 60 to 70. And most of you know that for the last 10 years, Kay and I have given away 91% of our income and we live on nine. Now, we do that because you cannot outgive God. And God says, you give to me and I'll give to you. And you know what I've learned? Is that while my giving went up, so did my influence. Last week when I was uh, testifying at the um, at DC, at the at Congress, I was testifying before Senate. Uh, one of the guys took me aside, Senator, and he asked me a question. He says, you know, Rick, I know this thing about Purpose Driven Life. It sold a gazillion copies, best-selling book in the world. Uh, you know, for four years, it was the best, it's the best-selling nonfiction book in American history. It's in 137 languages, it's in Guinness, it's the most translated book in the world, except for the Bible. It has two Guinness records. 
And he goes, why do you think God chose you to write the best-selling nonfiction hardback in all the time? I said, oh, I know why. I know why. He said, why? I said, because God knew he could trust me with the money. God knew that I would not spend it on myself. I wouldn't go buy a bigger house. I, I, I wouldn't go buy a bigger car. Uh, you know, I wear a watch from Walmart. You know, I, live, I drive a 15-year-old Ford truck. God knew I wouldn't spend the money on myself. I would use it to help more other people. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, shoot, if I wrote a gazillion seller, I'd give away millions too. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. I guarantee you wouldn't. Why? Because you're not being generous right now. And I was generous when we were out of work. And I was generous when I had no money. And I was generous when the cupboard was bare. And I was generous when Kay was holding the job and I was trying to put me through school. And I had a 40-year track record of being generous. And God knew he could trust me. And with that generosity came additional influence. And make friends. In this way, your generosity stores up a reward for you in heaven. What does it mean to use my worldly resources to benefit others and make friends? He's not saying go out and buy a bunch of friends. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. Take some of your money and use it to build bridges of friendship to bring people to Jesus Christ who are then going to be saved and they're going to go to heaven with you. And when you get to heaven, then there will be people in heaven who greet you and say, hey, you're here. Thank God for all you did. You gave some money that brought me to Jesus Christ. I'm in heaven because of you. I'm your friend forever. Is anybody going to be in heaven because of the way you use your money? I'm going to have tens of thousands of friends in heaven because of the way I've used my money. Is anybody going to be in heaven because of the way you used your money? Are you going to have any friends up there because people say, thank you, I'm here because of you. You bought a Bible, you sponsored a project, you built a church, you helped the pro program, you did other things, and through that I came to know the Lord. I'm here because of you. I'm your friend forever. That is what it means to be rewarded in heaven. And those rewards you're going to have forever. Everything I spend on myself on earth, I'm losing. Everything I invest in others and in God's work, I'm going to gain again in heaven. Where do I want to keep my greatest wealth? Here, where I get to use it for 80 years, or in heaven, where I get to use it for trillions of years in eternity. It's a no-brainer. Generosity will be rewarded in heaven. Rick Warren is a great success as a publisher, as an author. And he gives, he gives this testimony and it causes me to know, you know, you may not sell your possessions today. Some of you will because the Holy Spirit is already convicting you. Amen? Amen. Some of us, we will grow into it. And we will make a commitment to continue growing in terms of our generosity every year. Looking for more opportunities to do what? To give and to be a blessing. And what does that do to us? It heals our hearts. Generosity is the medicine that God gives for my heart against worry and selfishness. Left alone, I can be very greedy. If you leave me alone in a mall, I'll buy something. In fact, I saw an advert on a billboard when I was coming that Two Rivers loves women. Have you seen it? <laughs> Have you seen that one? That Two Rivers, we love women. I thought, I know why they love women. Because if you leave women and Two Rivers, they will definitely shop. If you live insensitive to the needs around you, you will continue feeding yourself. That's who we are. We are greedy and Jesus knew that. And he wanted to deliver us from the greed that consumes us from inside. And giving us an opportunity like Rick Warren to grow in our generosity because our hearts have been freed from the worry of tomorrow. 
We have received that freedom, friends. We have an inheritance that cannot fail. Our mansions in heaven are secure. Can you imagine? We have been saved to the uttermost. Therefore, we, of all other human beings, are the ones who have the highest, highest propensity to be generous. More than any other people. Because Christ has far secured us. So there are a few things I would like to ask you to think about as I come to a close. Number one, what can we do to grow rich and towards God? What can we practically do to financially invest in eternity? I would first say number one, if the Holy Spirit convicts you that actually you need to sell some of the possessions you have. You know, I was having a chat with Brother Mairori after the first sermon. He was telling me, I decided... I decided that, you know, I used, to, I used to always be asking where are the next plots being bought. And I just used to be there. And I have all these many plots I have bought and they are all idle. And I wasn't developing them. I was just buying them. Because the buying spree is on... I mean, in my heart was just buying, buying, buying. I'm not developing them. I have nothing. <laughs> I'm just locking money that is so useful for the kingdom of God. And I'm not even growing it. I'm not doing anything with it in particular. I am just satisfied that they are owned by me. Some of you, the Lord may challenge you to dispose some of that and redirect it to the work of God. That's number one. And don't think I'm talking to the neighbor. I'm talking to you. Number two, I'd like you to pray this week to ask the Holy Spirit to help you grow sensi sensitive to the needs of the people around you. Who are the needy people that are around you? You know, my wife and I, my wife and I, when we discussed about this, we agreed that anyone who will ever be brought to us or anybody who will ever come to us with a need, we will never turn them back without doing something about it. Because we believe that anybody who God brings our way, you don't even need to go look for them on social media. Where you are, I am sure, there are needy people around you. There are conversations maybe you have not even had with your watchman. There are conversations you don't even know about with the lady who works in your house. Or the tea girl who works in your office. They have needs, but they have nobody to talk to. If only you became interested in their lives. If only you asked whether their children go to school. If only you learned whether their children have gone to the university as you as were going to the university. God has blessed you more so that you can be a channel to them. And as a church, we need to get out of our capsules and sometimes take a matatu. One of just I mean, two days or one day, you know, we just take a matatu and feel how Kenya feels, you know? And... <laughs> And interact with human beings and just ask God to bring about to you someone you can minister to. Some of them are students. And you know, I interact with students every day when I go to preach. And I listen to horrifying stories. And I say, I need to do something about it. And there is no need that God, you know, scripture says that God will supply you need so that in every instance at all times, you will have enough to give. Praise the Lord. So number one, I'd like to ask you that the Holy Spirit would make you sensitive. Ask the Holy Spirit to make you sensitive. What are the needs around you, even within your extended family? You know, sometimes we have endless meetings in our extended family discussing how the, ch the child of so-and-so will be educated. And you're waiting for this long meeting to decide how to raise 20,000. And even you, you are there discussing it for many, many weeks on WhatsApp, how to raise 20,000, which is money you can raise alone. You're waiting for everybody to contribute the 500, 500, and 99. Take it up. And you don't need to have your name on it. Do something about it. Respond to it. Converse with the people who work in your house. Educate them. Let them be blessed because they have interacted with you. Number two, identify a missionary that gives you a, a contact with those who are the front line of disciple making. There is something different about having someone relating personally 
with someone who is at the front line of ministry. There's something it does. I know I am one of them. And I, I, I always have this opportunity to share with my friends who work in a different space and sector about what's happening at the front line. I also do it because we also as a family support another missionary. And we relate with that missionary. He comes home and tells us what is happening, where he is. And it was always a blessing for my family so that we don't become selfish.